making sure. And okay, so everyone, um, this is the last session for today. Um, and just a little bit of the background. That's interesting. Ah, there. Just a, a little, a, a little bit of background of where this comes from. During the consultation meeting that we had in determining the agenda for this meeting, there was a side channel conversation going on in the chat. And um, at the end of the meeting, Alan pointed out to me, I should really take a look at what was happening in the side conversation in the chat channel. And what that side conversation was about was the conversation around alternate credentialing in higher education. And I think some of the spirit of the education, I wasn't actively watching it myself until after the fact, but some of the spirit of that conversation was maybe within OERU, you shouldn't all be focused about around the traditional formal academic credit transfer stuff. And there was a bit of a conversation going on there. And there was a suggestion to include this discussion in the meeting agenda. And that's what this session is about. So I've asked a, a bunch of folk who know a lot more about the stuff than what I do, uh, Christine uh, from Thompson Rivers University to facilitate co the conversation. But, and we've invited two protagonists. One, uh, Dr. Alan Davis from Quantum Polytechnic University, who was actively engaged in the side conversation. And Phil Kerr from Otago Polytechnic, who is implementing an alternate credentialing model in the context of New Zealand. And just to give us a brief introduction, then we'll take it from there. So I'm going to hand over to you, Christine, and thank you so much for facilitating. Uh, thanks very much. And I'm actually going to resist going to the front of the room because in all good things, you should actually have rooms that you can actually go no matter where you wish to go. Ceiling, I'm not entirely sure. Um, oh, for goodness. Foiled again by technology. <laughs> Man. You should have a camera that goes around. Um, so I'm not going to say an awful lot with regards to introduction, but I think we, we need to have a bit of a philosophical debate. We've seen countries eliminate tuition fees, and I credit where credit is due. I lived in Scotland at the time the government actually said, if you're domiciled in Scotland, you will not pay tuition fees. Um, and there was an interesting court case that I won't bore you about now, but it's, you can be from England, Wales, and Northern Ireland and have to pay tuition fees, but you can be from the European Union and not pay tuition fees if you go to school in Scotland. After Brexit, that'll be a totally different game. And I think the debate is going to be about alternative credentialing and what what do we actually mean by that and why do we actually use the systems that we use and I'll look forward to hearing what Alan and Phil have to say about this entire debate because what does it actually mean I have a very nice piece of parchment I have three of them actually they sit in my they're um, artfully displayed in my guest bathroom, which makes people laugh. But it, I think it is quite important. And employers say, well, what are your credentials? Well, what do you mean by my credentials? And I know I think these are the debates that we actually need to get into, particularly when we're looking at PLAR, experiential learning, and what all of this means as well. So did you two flip a coin? Did you want to flip a coin? <laughs> okay, Alan, over to you. Okay, let's get this show on the road. Uh, Phil and I have not made any, had any contact, not even eye contact on this, so we've no idea what we're each going to say. And, you know, I made one little quip on the chat. Never do that. Never say anything pithy on a chat that Wayne might read because you'll end up in this situation. Um, <clears throat> I am not a typical, uh, apparently I'm speaking on behalf of universities. I am not a typical uh, university president. KPU is not a typical university. It is uh, an applied sort of teaching university that was created out of a college 
uh, had polytechnics stuck into its name to keep it honest and keep it as applied as possible, though we have many purely academic programs that you would recognize anywhere. And it, it is an open institution. Technically, it's open. Any adult, anybody of adult a, uh, college age can come to us and find a pathway through to uh, college and university education, in theory. They have to be motivated. They have to have certain levels of of skills and uh, et cetera, but we do everything we can uh, to give people that pathway. Not many do that. Uh, not many uh, succeed, even though on paper uh, we are established that way. The fact is that we are completely organized around the high school graduate who comes in with at least a B in English 12 or something, a C plus in English 12. You kind of have to be already uh, you know, graduated and through school and, and, and all our focus really is actually on that population. Very little for the non-traditional adult learner, although we're trying to fix that. And to some degree, the OERU is part of our strategy to unpack things and rebuild them so that we can address all types of learners, including partnering with our colleagues up the road at Thompson Rivers uh, Open Learning. I'm not a typical university president. I've bounced around a bit between adult-focused institutions, open institutions, uh, online, uh, and on campus. And uh, to some degree, I know I'm preaching to the converted here. So it's you know, if I was giving this, uh, if I was talking to another crowd, I might sort of embellish that a bit. But it's it's understand. Uh, it's neat. It's important to understand where I'm coming from. British Columbia, and I've taught for many years in British Columbia, years ago when I was of teaching age, uh, is the most highly articulated system in the world, I, as far as I can tell anyway. Although they picked up the idea from Alberta, they ran with it and created a system whereby originally the three research universities would articulate the courses being offered by all the community colleges so that anybody could go to college for one or two years and have every course in the university transfer program recognized at the appropriate university. It took years and years of sweat and labor for everybody to move their courses around, adjust their syllabi so that that transfer was as seamless as possible. It was documented. Uh, it now is because every, almost every college has degree granting authority to some degree or other and there's teaching universities and, and other institutions. There's now a sort of 25 by 25 matrix of course by course articulations between receiving and sending institutions and we're all receiving and sending. So you can imagine what this looks like, but you can go into the BC Council of Articulate, uh, what is it? Right, those guys. You can go in there and you can type in the course from whatever place you're at and you can see the equivalent course anywhere else. It is a work of art. It is also a big set of handcuffs when it comes to trying to recognize learning in a different way because it's all about the curriculum. It's the tyranny of the curriculum. And at my institution, we will obsess about a tiny revision to a course outline that goes through several Senate committees, then is approved by Senate. But they won't talk about teaching and learning. They'll talk about tiny revisions to, little, to courses and electives and then the structures of programs. And, it, and they're comfortable. Everyone's comfortable talking about this. You know, they don't get into the assessment methods or into anything um, uh, more interesting. The, and, and then, of course, the, the, the faculty uh, then take the course outlines and then they generate their course presentations, which they hold copyright to and everything like this. It, it's a very, it's a tightly structured system. And the programs themselves, a the business uh, program in particular, has this tightly structured pathway of prerequisites, required courses, co-requisites, all perfectly aligned. It's like paint by numbers degree. There is no wiggle room. There is no, no area for exploration. If somebody does come in for prior learning assessment and uh, has some experience, we send them to Thompson Rivers. They know how to do a portfolio. They send us back a transcript and we try to stuff it in. But it's, it's actually, the hardest part is actually finding room in the degree to put any kind of experiential learning in there. So we're about to uh, launch a Bachelor of General Studies that will allow for much more 
uh, is much more open with respect to accepting that type of transfer credit. But it is a bit odd that we've got this incredibly well articulated transfer credit system, which is starting to be of a bit of a problem because it turns out that employers increasingly want to know what the graduates can do and what they know and how they can apply it and they're not really very interested in what grades they got on their transcript. Students also are um, questioning the value of the transcripted degree itself. Uh, they're more inclined now, or increasingly inclined, particularly with the labor, labor market very hot, they, they get what they need and they go get a job. Then, then they come back and they get a bit more. Then they uh, either diversify or advance in their jobs, then they come back. You know, somebody called this looping through education and Stanford came up with this notion of actually rather than paying your fees all up front, you just pay a subscription. And every time that you need more learning, you come back because your sub subscription allows you to do that. And after a while, presumably somebody says, poof, you've got enough credits for a degree, here's your degree, carry on. Because that's the way it's going to be. Everybody, everybody forecasting the future work is talking about uh, the need for reskilling, upskilling on a continuous basis. How are we going to validate that? How are we going to assess that, etc.? Some have talked about an enhanced transcript. That is, you take the traditional transcript, but you can kind of pro you can click on it and go into a bit like a badge. You can go in and you can explore what exactly happened in that course. You might see artifacts uh, that the student used, and you can see. <laughs> the marked transcripts, uh, the marked uh, papers that they had, so you can see where the strengths and weaknesses of the, of the student were. Um, uh, but some way, uh, badges, of course, we've talked about that, that attest to the skills and competences that people have. And, and I'm still a big fan of the old e-portfolio, although people don't talk about it too much, it's a bit clumsy. Um, uh, but, you know, I think in our School of Business, they encourage the students to join LinkedIn and to make full use of LinkedIn in terms of demonstrating and showing uh, what their competencies are, are outside of the, the transcript. And the, 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 there's still some promise for that. And in the K-12 curriculum, uh, the, the high school curriculum, am I, am I talking nonsense to people? The, the, yeah, the K to 12, the high school curriculum in British Columbia now is going to come out with a portfolio alongside the transcript and increasingly move towards a more holistic assessment of what students actually know and can do. And this year we piloted the first admissions into KPU based on the portfolio and not on the transcript. And uh, the results have yet to be seen, but we're kind of, we've got some pilot projects we're doing and we're kind of ahead of the game in that. Um, so I think I'll just stop there and hand it over to um, uh, Phil. But I'll just go back to the discussion we were having before about partner engagement and why we're all part of this. I see this kind of discussion and the discussion of micro-credentials and open texts and open education resources at KBU to be, as you, somebody else mentioned, the Trojan horse, to a more open view of curriculum and actually a closer approximation to what it is that we say that we're about. We have this new mission statement that we worked on for over the past year, a wonderful new vision for the university, and a mission statement that says, by thinking and acting together, we transform lives and empower positive change. It's a lovely statement of mission, it seems to me. But then what we, we translate that right now into admission requirements, which actually don't work because they don't seem to predict success very well, and course requirements and sequences and prerequisites and co-requisites, and this sort of paint-by-numbers approach to degrees that has no, bears no relation to the real outcomes uh, that our graduates have. Somewhere along the line, it does work because the graduates do graduate. They seem to go on. They seem to be happy. But it makes me worry that somewhere along the line, we're by focusing so much on what is a well-entrenched approach to the assessment of learning and the demonstration of what people have learned that we're going to wake up one day and realize we missed the bus. Phil. Please, please, please. Please, don't stop, don't stop. 
it goes. Oh, oh sir, that's okay. Does it actually work? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. You what? You have to get, get up here and patiently eat it. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, well, Wayne's asked me to talk a little bit about what are we doing at Otago Polytechnic and what's going on in New Zealand. Um, so I might start with what's going on in New Zealand and then rotate back to um, uh, the journey at Otago Polytechnic. Well, in New Zealand, we have officially embraced um, micro-credentials um, as part and parcel of our um, qualifications framework. So they, they're there. Um, so we have um, ordinary credentials. Um, in New Zealand's uh, case, that's uh, New Zealand certificates, New Zealand diplomas and degrees um, and postgrad and so on and so forth. Um, and now we have micro-credentials, which by definition are just small credentials. <laughs> um, and uh, th there's quite a lot of interesting discussion went on. Um, and eventually the realisation came about that a qualification is a credential and a credential is a qualification. Um, and uh, so we weren't dealing with anything more than small qualifications. Okay, so <clears throat> the interesting thing though is that um, in embracing micro-credentials officially, um, we do not have a regulated market for micro-credentials. Um, so it is anyone, anyone, can offer anything at all as a micro-credential. Um, but if um, one wants it endorsed by our qualifications authority, uh, then there is a, an approval process to go through. Um, and I guess providers will, will want an endorsement, uh, particularly if they want um, government funding. Uh, and we haven't quite got to that point yet. Um, our, we have two agencies, the NZQA is the Qualifications Authority um, and the Tertiary Education Commission is the Funding Authority. Uh, and they are halfway through the process of deciding uh, what micro-credentials will they fund. And they've got a half an answer. Um, they will fund ones which NZQA approves, um, but they may fund more. <laughs> Okay, let's now rotate back. Um, so it was three years ago, we decided to develop and launch a micro-credential service. Um, and we did that for um, uh, 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 very strong reasons. Look, we're a polytechnic. Um, we're not a polytechnic um, university. Um, we are unashamedly vocational. Uh, we don't have arguments about academic freedom. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're not free to teach whatever we want. Um, we're, we're there um, to, to contribute um, to uh, the productivity of um, New Zealand industry and to the cohesiveness of New Zealand society. And we do that through a process of skilling people in some way. And no, no one argues about that. So it's important to, to have that bit of context uh, because uh, when we were sort of looking at what's going on in the world, um, there are a couple of themes, um, and you'll probably recognise them. Uh, first of all, consumers um, starting to resist the high price of traditional qualifications, um, and that's and uh, and the high cost. So the price, what they pay, the cost, the opportunity cost, foregone income, um, foregone other life activities, and so on and so forth, um, to invest in a uh, whatever a two, three, or a four year. Um, qualification. And at the same time, employers were saying, those quals don't do it for us. They don't cut the mustard. Um, that, um, you know, technology is shifting skill needs so rapidly. And by the time you folk there um, running post secondary institutions, um, first of all, pick up on your radar that there's new skill sets needed, then plan them, and then get them into your three year or four year degree then we're six years down the track before graduates emerge that we can hire and that's no good. Um, and so it was really clear that um, we were starting to lose our, we we're in danger of losing our relevance um, as uh, an institution um, and, and I guess as part of a sector. And indeed in New Zealand um, right now, 
Um, our sector is going through an enormous amount of um, um, scrutiny and we're about to have something happen to us. Um, some great change is going to come out sometime in the next three or four weeks because as far as our government is concerned, you have lost your relevance. Um, and um, to be truthful, we have. Um, and um, we're going to have to try and get it back. And these micro-credentials are going to be part and parcel of getting it back. So the reality is we took, we took micro-credentialing on board um, because we wanted to provide um, an opportunity for people to get skills recognised um, that um, they needed for more immediate um, uh, career prospects um, and uh, to, to develop them and have them recognised. And to, for us to be a heck of a lot more responsive um, to changing um, skill demands. Uh, so we developed our service, which we called, um, we branded EduBits. Um, and you can go on to edubits.co.nz uh, and have a look. The website's a bit clunky. Um, it's going through revision uh, currently. But it'll give you a good idea of what we're doing. We deliberately set it up, first of all, as an assessment service. Um, and so our edubits, our micro-credentials, are describing um, skill and knowledge sets that make sense in their own right. Um, and um, we're encouraging people to um, you know, get recognised for those smaller skill sets that they've got, particularly if they've got no um, traditional credentials to take off to employers. But the second half of the service um, was a training service leading to assessment and credentialing. And we we're really clear that it was necessary to split those two off um, because we absolutely saw the credentialing, the assessment and credentialing service as where we could make a huge contribution to, um, uh, to upskilling in New Zealand context. Um, in terms of um, responding to employers, um, actually, I'll put it the other way around. We are astonished at employer interest in um, our service. Um, and our, our biggest problem right now, and I say this without exaggeration, is um, can we not drop the ball? Um, because there is just so much work coming at us. And I'll just give you um, a, a couple of examples. Uh, we've got a group of professionals in, in New Zealand called economic development um, professionals, but there is no qualification for them. Um, they, they articulate that they desperately need um, a structured professional development program to improve their effectiveness. Um, there's about a thousand of them New Zealand wide. Um, we've just got the contract to develop their professional development system using micro-credentials. Another example, um, a new primary school curriculum um, has been developed for physical education for little kids. Every primary teacher has to be upskilled in that curriculum. Um, the organisation responsible for um, those um, the, the teacher's skills, uh, it's called uh, Physical Education New Zealand, uh, approached us and said, can we please partner, let's do this through micro-credentials. We, we need, the teachers want to be recognised for the upskilling they do. Let me give you another example. Um, New Zealand has the staggering uptake per head of electric vehicles. Um, and so your local mechanic is now having people drive in with an electric vehicle that's broke. Oh, what do I do? No training. Um, it's still a year away before the trades certificates that will train new people in electric vehicle uh, safe handling and maintenance will be able to graduate people. Um, we developed in a matter of a, a couple of months um, a suite of micro-credentials to um, upskill the existing um, mechanic workforce in electric vehicles. And the one that I really, really love, we've got this um, really innovative uh, general practitioner who has decided he is going to democratize general practice. Um, and he started with a digital health service for kids. Um, and literally, um, he is, um, uh, he's got this workforce of people who teach or look after kids, who he argues are the ones that recognize um, when kids are sick, um, often before the parents do. Um, and um, he's developed a system whereby these people, they're a new paraprofessional workforce. 
um, who through using digital technologies will diagnose up to, I think it's 10 common ailments that kids, young kids get, um, and then get treatment to them in literally hours. Fantastic, isn't it? That workforce has to be trained. Guess what? It's gonna be trained through Otago Polytechnic Edubits, um, because we could tailor the training and deliver it really, really quickly. Um, and so when we sort of summarize all of that, why did we get into this business? Because we wanted to be really, really relevant um, in a rapidly changing world. And the reality is we are. And look, um, in your own constituencies, if it, if it replicates our experience and, and you're able to launch a, um, um, a micro-credential service, a, a well thought out one, you will be inundated. It will be a big part of your business. And I'll finish on this. It was about eight months ago that 100 employers in New Zealand signed a full page advertisement in the main New Zealand newspaper. Yes, we do have a main one <laughs> um, saying, we don't care about qualifications. We don't need them. You can come and work with us without them. What we're interested in is your personal skills um, and quite specific skills for the job. But when we followed up, actually, they quite like the idea of these micro-credentials around the sort of stuff. So, so that streamlines their whole screening and approval process. So one of the pathways we're going down is um, micro-credentialing transferable skills. And I'll finish on that note. Thanks very much, Phil. Now, I do note that the notes said five minutes each. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I figured that. Um, Alan, can I get you to come up here as well, please? And um, I'm only gonna keep this to about five minutes because I think that there are there's a gathering later on and I think this conversation will take place as we move forward. Um, I really appreciate the depictions of the things that are going on specifically at KPU and at, at Otago, but also the general aspects about what's going on in BC and also what's happening in New Zealand. Um, the BC Credit Transfer Service works in theory. It doesn't always work in practice um, because we have things like faculty councils saying, well, that's all very well and good, but we are not accepting anything more than the first semester of the first year to transfer into our program, even if you have a college diploma. And if Clive were here, he'd be able to wax lyrical about SQUIFI, which is the Scottish Credit and Qualification Framework. Um, and that's another interesting, and yes, it, its nickname is SQUIFI because when you look at the initials. But I wanted to ask the two of you, what would the world look like in your areas without co-requisites and prerequisites because this is one of the things that is barrier to entry and is a huge issue and this is you talked about Alan about the tyranny of the curriculum and I find one of the biggest tyrannies is the so-called prerequisite and co-requisite so which one of you wants to tackle uh, because the joy of being an unashamed real polytechnic yeah. Not, <laughs> not having any academic freedom. <laughs> um, our our um, academics have to mount a powerful case um, to, for us to permit a prerequisite or a co-requisite to go into a curriculum. So the default is you can't have them. So the world is as it is right yeah. now. Yeah. I, I, I want to be like that. Uh, yes. um, yeah, the, the other thing, maybe this is a, kind of a segue to another thought, is that it kind of relates to this healthcare thing, the democratize, democratization of healthcare, because I think healthcare system is, is a, um, a scam, um, just so you know, get that on the table. But I think we're, we're in danger of going the same way. And we're very, very, although we complain about the funding, and you know, we're always on the edge financially as an institution, we, are, we have a lot of, we have a $200 million budget and it's way too expensive 
I mean, there has to be a more effective way where we actually take the resources and direct them much more, uh, with much more focus onto actually the task that's there. And I think some of these new ways, why we're part of OER, you find new ways where we can kind of get to the point a lot quicker than having all this other infrastructure. Some of it's kind of embedded in academic freedom and in faculty councils and all these processes. We're going to find ourselves out of a job one day if we don't fix this and find other ways to do it. Now, some universities are actually quite good through their continuing education to look a lot more like Otago does. They're starting to do things sort of on the fringes, but all the action is happening actually in those areas. It's not happening very much at all like in the, uh, in the regular faculties. Uh, so uh, Raj would, Rajiv was talking about the University of Buffalo is doing some nice work in micro credentials. Tends to be around the edges right now, but it is going, either the core of the institution is gonna start adopting that model, or one of these days people will say that's just too expensive. We can't afford that. And you've created a situation where um, you own the knowledge, you own the credentialing, you, you own people's lives, and that's just not tolerable, I don't think. We've got, to, we, we've got to do a better job of democratizing higher education. I just wanted to add a bit to where I think things are really gonna go. Um, I think we, we are going to switch our curriculum development model to a, a stackable micro-credentials model. Um, and I, I think what that's going to do is to uh, strike a, a major blow for education access, um, that people will never leave failures, they'll only leave successful, um, and they'll follow where they need to follow. And this is not everyone, this is at the margin, but it's the margins that are important. Um, I'm, I've never been a silver bullet person. So when we talk about the, the system transforming, it will transform at the margin, but in a really, really significant way. And, uh, and I, I think that, uh, that that whole stackable credentials model, and, and you know, people criticize and say, will be, this will be like getting bags of licorice all sorts. But, but I actually think those, those of you that have strong uh, recognition of prior learning processes, uh, this is what I think will happen. People will follow their needs. And then at some point they'll step back and say, I got a, I got a stack of these micro credentials. And, and I now need one of these other big ones because that's, the world will probably still be valuing those big ones. And there's a process that, that I like to term gluing it together, um, that, that people go through a process of saying, I did all this stuff and I'm now gonna make sense of this in a, in a reflective way, the most powerful, most advanced higher educational skill, critical reflection. They will, they will glue together all of that stuff into a cohesiveness that makes sense for them. And then think about what we've now got. We, we've got true democratization of, of higher or further education. At the moment, we have a system that says it, it, it takes an academic to put value on a program of learning. And I ask the question, why can't individuals put their own value on the, the, the package of learning that's theirs and meaningful to them. And guess what? We've got a generation coming through that don't want stuff in these packages. They want bits here and they will glue it all together at some point. And we've just got to be there waiting to help them glue when the time comes. I don't want to uh, keep people, we're, we're coming up to the allotted time, but I think what we actually had here is a topic for conversation and perhaps a conference which is disrupting higher education through OER. Because this is, this is what exactly what you're talking about is the change to the status quo. And that includes changing the metrics by which post-secondary institutions are measured by as uh, for our funding. Um, you know, completions are counted on how many students completed the program that they came, that, that left with the degree. What is meant by student success? Is it getting one micro-credential and that person goes on to doing 
great things with their lives. That, that is student success. So I think we're now talking about disrupting the academy. And uh, look forward to hearing what the two of you have to say about that. So how about a round of applause to our protagonist? I'm going to call it a wrap and thank you very much for your positive and active contributions today. Uh, we'll see you again tomorrow um, where, we, where, where we are going to make the future happen. Uh, so we're going to be focusing on making these future, futures happen. And thank you. I hope to see you this evening wherever we connect. And um, thank you very much. <laughs>